What he thought and did were policy. He then said his scheme had the desired effect. It cured that man and some others of running away. Olada Equiano. If you're a white authority, you're constantly trying to figure how tightly you want to impose the lid with respect to people running away. How fierce should the punishments be? You know, should it be a whipping? Should it be the loss of a finger or a hand or a foot? You know, should it be wearing uh, shackles perpetually? The entire system of control is based on physical punishment, often making examples out of people so that others will be intimidated. The colonial legislature passed laws designed to more tightly control the growing black majority. Planter records reveal punishments inflicted for infractions, large and small. 8th February, 1709. I rose at 5 o'clock this morning and then read a chapter in Hebrew and 200 verses in Homer's Odyssey. I ate milk for breakfast, I said my prayers. Jenny and Eugene were whipped. 17 April, Annika was whipped yesterday for stealing the rum and filling the bottle up with water. I said my prayers and I danced my dance. Eugene was whipped again for pissing in bed and Jenny for concealing it. I took a walk about the plantation Eugene was whipped for running away and had the bit put on him. I said my prayers. I had good health, good thoughts, and good humor. Thanks be to God Almighty. William Byrd, Virginia Planter. When you enslave a person, in some ways, you become a slave yourself because masters and slaves are natural enemies. And that's what the Europeans had to deal with. They had to deal with a population living amongst them, sometimes the majority of the population, in hostility. They lived amongst enemies. And as one Carolina planter said, nowhere on earth is mankind so plagued by enemies living within them as we are in our own homes. The Spanish are receiving and harboring all our runaway Negroes. They have found out a new way of sending our own slaves against us to rob and plunder us. We are not only at a vast expense in guarding our southern frontiers, but the inhabitants are continually alarmed. Arthur Middleton, acting governor, 1728. On the South Carolina frontier, Word spread of Africans and Indians coming up from Spanish Florida to attack planters, and of Spanish authorities offering runaways freedom on Florida soil. In Goose Creek, an Anglican minister complained of secret poisonings and bloody insurrections by certain Christian slaves. South Carolina is a pot ready to boil over. Imagine coming into a a setup that seems almost unbearable and finding that people have, have many of them have somehow rationalized it or, or are enduring it. You know, that's the best they can do. But you as a newcomer might feel, I'm not gonna put up with this. Better to die trying to change this. And there must have been hundreds of people like that in South Carolina in the 1730s. By the 1730s, close to 2,000 Africans were arriving at the port of Charleston each year. From 1735 to 1739, out of 11,000 slaves landed, more than 8,000 were listed as Angolans. What develops is a sense among the Europeans that slaves from certain areas have particular characteristics. Slaves from the Angola area are reputed among the English to be particularly difficult, to be rebellious. In St. Paul's Parish, 
there were close to a thousand new people who just a few years before had been taken from the Angola region of Africa. One of them, we only know his name, a man named Jemmy, apparently had come recently from Angola. He may not even have spoken English, but he may have had strong contacts with other Angolans. He had to try to build alliances, not only with other Angolans, other new arrivals, but with other Africans, African-Americans, um, people from, from a community that he was not that familiar with. And apparently he succeeded. During the early morning hours of September 9th, 1739, almost as soon as word is received in South Carolina that England and Spain are at war, some 20 Angolan slaves led by the man named Jimmy began marching towards St. Augustine and the promise of freedom. Just 30 miles from the Middleton's Oaks Plantation at the Stono Bridge, they seized a general store where there were arms and powder. They killed the storekeepers and left their heads on the doorstep. What better moment to start an uprising and try to strike out for St. Augustine and find freedom in Florida in the hope that uh, the Spanish authorities are willing to grant freedom to English-speaking slaves who escaped from the Carolinas into Florida. On the march south, the Africans did not kill every white they encountered. They spared Mr. Wallace, an innkeeper they knew to be kind to his slaves. But before the day ended, they had killed more than 20 people. As other slaves joined them, they became an army of almost a hundred, camped at the Edisto River, waiting for others to gather under their flag. The entire force of English North America was going to come down on them, because this was an issue not merely for those in South Carolina immediately surrounding this area. This, this was an issue for every European colonist everywhere in the colonies to quash this and to provide some exemplary punishment. Around noon, the nearest white settlers were alerted. By four in the afternoon, they caught up with the Negroes along the Edisto River and fired upon them. Eyewitnesses recorded that the rebels fought boldly but at least 14 were killed or wounded in the first attack. Others were surrounded, questioned, and then shot. The armed colonists then turned toward Charleston, and on mile post along the way, they left the heads of the executed men. Just the way war transforms people, this terrible transformation into race slavery had changed people by the middle of the 18th century. The, the violence you see at Stono uh, is a violence that had become pervasive in the culture. By the middle of the 18th century, this had become a way of life in the English colonies. Stono was sort of the beginning of the concept that the black population had to be utterly controlled. And the legislation that came out of Stono, the Negro Act, took away whatever liberties the Africans had. Freedom of movement, freedom of assembly. To earn money, to learn to read, all were outlawed. South Carolina imposed duties on all slave importations and encouraged European immigration in order to change the ratio of whites to blacks. The Negro Act became the model for slave laws throughout the mainland of British America. Happy. 
Why do you use those instruments of torture? Are they not fit to be applied by one rational being to another? And are ye not struck with shame and mortification to see the partakers of your nature reduced so low? But above all, are there no dangers attending this mode of treatment? Are you not hourly in dread of an insurrection? Olauda Equiano. News of the rebellion traveled quickly to New York, now the third largest city in British America. Most of Manhattan Island was unbroken wilderness, crossed by streams emptying into both the Hudson and East Rivers. By 1740, except for Charleston, South Carolina, no city in colonial America had so high a density of slave population as New York. Crowded onto the southern tip of the island lived 11,000 people, of which more than 2,000 were black. There was really an illusion of intimacy between enslaved blacks and their white slave owners who lived under the same roof. These people could not trust one another. In fact, the slave owners considered the enslaved blacks domestic enemies. Oh, oh. New York, November 18th, 1731. Be it ordained by the authority of this city that all Negro, mulatto, and Indian slaves that shall die within this city be buried by daylight. And for the prevention of great numbers of slaves assembling and meeting together at their funerals, under pretext whereof they have great opportunities of plotting and confederating together to do mischief, be it further ordained that not above 12 slaves shall assemble or meet together at the funeral. Minutes of the Common Council of New York. There were probably a lot of other issues going on in New York City at that time that made whites suspicious of blacks. There was, among the lower classes of blacks and whites, a lot of racial amalgamation. There was a lot of activity in the grog shops between blacks and whites, blacks frequenting taverns. New York City was a cosmopolitan place with people from various ethnic groups converging, lots of seamen, and blacks were very much a part of that. In taverns, black men illegally gathered, drank, and mingled with white New York residents. Many enslaved men in New York were hired out by their masters. They had relative freedom of movement and control over their own time. The African-American adult male is seen as the most troublesome, the most intractable, the most rebellious. Those are the persons who are growing in the population. By law, they're not supposed to be out after uh, sunset. By law, they're not supposed to uh, have any currency of their own. By law, they're not supposed to go and gather in numbers uh, of three or greater. By law, they're not supposed to be out drinking, yet every night they're out doing all of these things. There developed in colonial New York City a lively street life amongst black men and uh, enslaved and free. Uh, these black men organized into clubs or uh, gangs. Uh, and they were a constant presence on the streets. They even gathered at nights at the docks or in taverns. And they presented, according to the English authorities and anxious white residents, a public threat. On March 18, 1741, a fire broke out at Fort George the governor's official residence, whipped by violence.